right, hi everyone. This is my third Nordic APIs here in Stockholm. And it's always a super event. I mean, uh, great talks, uh, well organized, great food, don't you think? For, especially for a conference? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And my talk today is actually about food as well. So I'm, I'm talking about uh, pie, pie that's for sale. So normally at a, uh, um, at a conference that doesn't have API in the title, I might start with the definition of, of API. Uh, I don't have to do that here. That's great. But uh, I will start with definitions since I'm in Europe. Uh, so who thinks this is a pie? All right, good, good. How about this one? Yeah, Rob is keeping his hand up the whole time. Okay, yeah. This one? Ooh, some more, some more, good. And lastly, how about this one here? Oh, yeah. That's, that's my favorite, too. I think that's probably my father's favorite. He's, he's here in the audience as well. So uh, those are all pie. The, uh, to me, it's uh, you've got crust, you've got filling, and they're delicious, right? So that's what, uh, that's what makes pie. So uh, a pie that doesn't get eaten is pretty sad, and I think of an API that doesn't get called is also sad. So we've heard a lot of talks about making great APIs here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, how to encourage people to use those APIs, whether that's inside your own company, outside uh, your company. So one more thing that's not pi is, is toast and jam. Toast and jam is not pi. Uh, I show you this, first of all, uh, because my, uh, two of my kids are pretty cute. <laughs> and secondly, uh, so you can see my father and find him after and ask him what an API is. So, uh, continuing with definitions, though, the last one, I promise. This is also pi. Uh, and this is how, some of your, how all of your APIs look in some proportion. Uh, some amount of calls to them are internal. Uh, some amount maybe are, are just for partners, and then Perhaps for some or many of you, you have external uh, calls as well, which partners, internal and external, just that, it's an acronym for PI. That's, <laughs> what a fantastic coincidence. So, so, uh, so today, as, as I talk about the different rules for selling PI, I want you to think about those slices and how they each fit. And I believe that each of these uh, suits your API as well, no matter what the percentage of each of those slices of your pie is. So uh, these are the pie rules. This uh, is the bonus rule. It's optional. Uh, and so let's dive in and let's start with the first rule of pie which is that you must be tasty. So again, we talk, had a lot of people talk about how to make good APIs. So you want to make a pie that is good, but then you also have to tell everyone that it is good. And the, and the way that you tell them matters, and that's going to influence whether someone uses your API or not. So for example, I talked about crust and how much I, how much I like crust before. What if I told you about my crust like this? It's got flour, water, butter, sugar, salt, mm, right? <laughs> yeah, so the way that you talk about it matters. One of my favorite diagrams uh, ever is, uh, this is by Samuel Hewlett from User Onboard. And I love the way he's described here how it matters how you, how you talk about it, right? It's not what you're product is, it's what it allows your customer to be, what it allows to be done. So at an API conference, I'm aware of, uh, there are, there's an API conference drinking game. I know one of them is that you take a shot for every time you mention Twilio, so those of you playing, go ahead. But this is such a great example to me of, uh, of a 
of a company that talks about what you can do. That first sentence there is not about what it is. It's about what you can, what you can do. For a long time at Programmable Web, where I was the editor, I looked at announcement, uh, announcements for new APIs and additions to APIs that looked kind of like this. It was a lot about what it is, and my eyes would glaze over as I attempted to figure out what is this arithmetic API that allows divisors with values less than one. And my job was to find something interesting <laughs> in this and write about it. And I couldn't just not do that. I, at some point I had to, and so you find the piece there that is interesting. That you don't have to let that uh, be the job of someone else. It can be your job as you talk about it, whether it's releasing it internally to your company or releasing it to everyone. So to share knowledge, not features, as you, as you talk about your great API. And if you want a little bit more on this, you can go to sharedknowledgenotfeatures.com where I go into, uh, go into this and actually see me later because I have some stickers that look a lot like that. They're, actually, they're smaller, though. That's, I couldn't pack, I couldn't fit that in. Okay, so the second rule of Pi is to know your competition. And if you sell Pi, you might think that your competition is someone else that sells Pi, but I think you can think beyond that. That's why there's cookies here, uh, because really your competition is anyone who, uh, who sells something sweet, maybe. So to bring it into the API world, let's, let's think about your typical developer here, who's probably, it's probably a, a junior developer, I'm gonna guess. But uh, if you think about wanting to reach that developer with your API, you might think of, of competing against maybe the other companies that you consider your competition. But what I learned after Programmable Web working for multiple API providers is that your most common competition is probably that developer, someone building something internally. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. This is SendGrid's most popular guide. And in that, we detailed exactly how you would rebuild SendGrid, essentially. If, if email deliverability is important to you, here's how you do it in a couple dozen pages, right? Going through everything. And at the end of that, someone says, wow, that's, that's complicated. I think I'll pay SendGrid to do that. Similarly, at Orchestrate, which was a database as a service API, uh, we exposed the features of multiple NoSQL databases. Well, there are a lot of potential NoSQL databases that you could choose, many of those under 10 years old. Uh, and so Orchestrate competes against anyone who might be building that, might be wanting to roll their own and run their own database. So I wanna, wanna take a moment for the, the I part of the pie to, to say, you might be thinking, well, I only have internal use. That's the, the entirety of that pie is internal use. So there is no such thing as competition, and I would, I would disagree. I think you have many ways here. Direct database access, probably the most common one. Uh, and even if, uh, meaning that you have someone potentially writing data that is different than you would expect, I uh, probably, Another common one, the multiple versions of the same business logic. You have multiple departments using the same data and potentially exposing different answers to the same question to your customers, right? And then scraping, that was shocking to me to ever, to ever learn that, but scraping actually happens internally as well as externally. People within the same company, it's being easier to scrape their own site than actually share their data and come up with a way to do that. Uh, and then at the very least, lack of knowledge from your coworkers of how to actually use the API that you do have, or even knowing that it exists. So, another rule to show your face, hopefully, hopefully without pie on it. But to, to make it known who is behind the API. Again, whether it's internal or external, who is it? And 
that's the question. Who's, whose face is that that should be the face of the API, whether it's external or internal? And I have an easy answer, and again, if my suitcase was larger, I would have packed a giant mirror, and I would have held it out to you all, because you're all at an API conference today, which means you are the face. When you go back to your companies, you are the face of the API. So where do you show that face? There's a lot of, lot of places uh, that you might show your face. Uh, if, again, for the internal folks, go to a team stand-up at uh, CenturyLink, uh, CenturyLink Cloud, which acquired Orchestrate. That's what, that's what we did. We would show up at team stand-ups. We would show up and talk to teams that then went on to build upon the Orchestrate API from within CenturyLink. So there's, uh, there's more to that, and we'll get into some in a little bit. But uh, I want to talk about how you help someone begin to use your API. And that really means giving them the tools. Hopefully you don't just say, here's, here's the pie, go for it, right? You maybe, you maybe give them a fork. Give them the tool that is right for the, uh, for the job. I mean, in this example, this is, um, this is a pie-eating contest. You probably don't need a fork if it's a pie-eating contest, though you may notice that they actually gave that guy a fork. I don't know why. So to help someone dig into the API, getting started materials is a great way. So again, this is an orchestrate example, but we walked people through the orchestrate API with examples of how to, use, how to use it and how they could build something with it. You can't get much better than, uh, than GitHub for the approach to working with developers. GitHub has a great getting started guy, and then you can see that uh, it grows beyond that for these are specific use cases that a developer would be interested in, in using for the GitHub API. And then I love this, this line here that I highlighted in the Keen documentation because it tells you that the technical wizard will take eight minutes and the sorcerer's apprentice will take 20 minutes. And then of course they do outline the three steps, the things that you, things you need to do to actually get started with Keen. Many of you may have SDKs or libraries or wrappers. Those are a great way to get someone started, to be able to, uh, to use it because you have shown them, uh, you've given them the tools that they can plug directly into their programming language of choice. Uh, a site I run called Every Developer, the, those libraries and the getting started guides are uh, the top two things in a DX, a developer experience index that I created. If you want to see all 13, I, uh, I put it together for you so that happy to share that with this awesome API audience. So everydeveloper.com slash Nordic APIs if you want to see all of those and we can talk about which ones you like and don't. Stormpath, they do a great job here of, of being able to have these SDKs in the language that the developer wants. And lots of them, and frameworks in addition to, to languages. Stripe begins with the simple question, is you want it on your website or on your mobile app? Nexmo versions their, uh, their SDKs uh, to be able to really treat them like their own products. And then if you really want to get into SDKs, check out uh, sdks.io, which has a whole bunch of them. It's from the API-matic guys. So again, the question for those of you who, uh, who might only use, have their API internally is, does developer experience matter here? So in this case, I say you don't, you don't want to be the bottleneck for your coworkers or the giraffe neck or cause rubber neck. There's no necking. No, no necks involved. You want to be able to make it as easy as possible for your coworkers to use your API. So of course developer experience matters, perhaps more than it would for an external API. So you don't just want to sell that one slice of pie one time. You want to be able to continue to sell pie, continue to have people use your API. And so to do that, you want to share the complete vision. So the getting started that I talked about is really about the time to first hello world. And really, that's a tiny little section of a developer's entire experience with your API. It might be 
some time to actually go from Hello World to Prototype and uh, perhaps to take that into a complete app and be able to debug it and maintain it. So there's a lot more beyond there. This is just a sampling of what that could be. Uh, I talked a little bit about integrating into frameworks with the SDKs. Uh, having complete sample applications, another, another big one. And for those of you playing the drinking game, get out your last shot glass here because Twilio does a great job of this as well. They actually incorporate about half of those, that list that I just showed there before only in their tutorials section where they have complete apps that are use cases that you can then download or uh, fork the repo and you can walk through also and it's a tutorial of a complete app and it highlights the section that you're interested in. So if you haven't looked at the tutorial section, this was launched earlier this year, uh, check it out. And then also once you get to the GitHub repo, you could just deploy straight to Heroku with the Heroku button too. So another way of low friction to being able to have someone use your API. And again, you can steal this for internal to your company too, be able to help people get up, up to speed. So finally, and kind of as a, a corollary to showing your face is to be available for questions. So that's part of, part of showing your face is to then uh, interact. And many of those same places uh, where you should be available for those questions, showing intercom here as an example, because not only does it literally show your face, but then it also allows you to be able to have a conversation with the developer. Uh, which can be hugely valuable. So, just to summarize here, for, for the pie here, we, we want our pie to be tasty, we need to know the competition, you need to show your face, help them dig in, share the complete vision, and be available for questions, which I believe I am right now. Thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, questions for Adam? Getting tired? Came a long ways to answer your question. Multiple people can fill out a, 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 a JWT <laughs> into a form, but... Ah, can't, that's, that's, can't come up with a question? That's, no, not, not in the afternoon. Which was impre impressive enough to, you know, most conferences you'd be like, well, we're taking the drone home with us right. because no one was able to solve it. I, I, there was a question, though, at the pre-event party. Do you remember that one? You were asked, uh, how do you jumpstart the developer evangelism program? And I loved your answer to that. So maybe you could repeat that. Do you remember I, it? I, I think it was Buy Me Bourbon, wasn't that the, <laughs> was that the one? No, uh, yeah, so, so the, with the developer evangelism program, it's definitely a long view that you have. You have to believe that by helping developers, this is external developers that we're talking about here, you have to believe that, uh, that it's going to be a program that, that works. And sometimes belief is not something you can sell to someone who needs to pay your salary and maybe pay you to go to events. And so, uh, so I suggested looking at, uh, at the way that developers sign up and taking a snapshot of what your data is there. How many come to the site, how many sign up, how many make an API call, and focus in on those inflection points where you can provide data, where you can say, we're gonna try to make a getting started guide, which we believe will increase the percentage of people who go from sign up to making an API call. And so you do that and then you compare your data and I've got to think if you have no getting started guide that you're going to show results there. And from that you can then encourage belief by showing real data. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. So Adam has a wealth of knowledge. I know you're maybe a little sleepy now. Oh, we have one. Jason, do we have a sec just for this one? Okay, great. Hello, um, Hi. you mentioned SDKs, and I agree, they're a very good way to help people
people use your API, but the problem is the overhead of maintaining them and the sheer number of SDKs, so for Android, iOS, Python, PHP. Um, and often people advise on just building an API that's easy to use rather than working on SDKs. Right. Uh, so, uh, so certainly you'll have some percentage that do use it directly, and I think you could influence that with really good getting started materials for direct access to the, to the API. It still has to be probably language specific because the way that you would make a request in Python is going to be different than the way you'd make a request in Node.js. Uh, but then you might also look at, um, at some of the ways of being able to generate the SDKs. And you'll have to decide whether, it is, whether they're good enough to be able to to release as SDKs. The SDK, SDKs.io I mentioned, uh, API Matic, has tools to be able to, from a, uh, an open API spec, be able to um, uh, generate these SDKs. So you might look at that, which would decrease the amount of effort. Because again, yeah, when I showed Nexmo and how they version each one, that means that there are an engineer or more who are working on each of those, right? And I understand that's, that's a large effort for sure. So, so looking into auto-generation and seeing if that is good enough for you, and uh, then if you want direct access, uh, put your energy into the getting started materials and other materials that'll help encourage that. Yeah, good question. Thank you all very much. All right, much. thanks, yeah. Adam.